Hey guys, I'm going to do a video today and readdress the topic of the changing of times and laws. And I made a playlist on this topic. And I'll link the playlist to this video. I'll link the video to the playlist uh, because I want to readdress this and even rethink this, if you will. I want to show a video of something I came across that sparked my interest in this again to re-examine um, scripture and take a look at this in depth and the hypothesis again of this change of times of laws that we see in Daniel 7 is the possibility of a thousand years being added to our chronology to our timeline so that we're not living possibly in the year 2019 but 1019 and we're not 2019 years since the birth of Christ but 1019 years since God manifests in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. And, you know, you may ask again, you know, this sounds crazy. Where are this thousand years? Where's evidence of this? You know, how do we know um, that this could even be a possibility? Well, I want to show you again, and I've made a few hours of video showing a lot of evidence of this, and I'll re-explain it for those who haven't seen the videos and then show you some more um evidence of how I think this could have happened. But in short, we know this thousand year period that possibly has been added to our calendar very well. Um, we studied it growing up in our history classes. It's referred to as the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. This time period between roughly 500 and 1500 AD, which we don't know much about. And there's a lot of spurious evidence that it even existed if you actually look at the evidence. What if this time period was fabricated and added right in the middle of our timeline, making it a time and times and the dividing of our timeline? And again, what if the purpose of this is to one distance ourselves from Christ on both sides from his first coming and his 100% certainty second coming. So, you know, what I want to do is, again, show you some coins and maps, documents, different things to show you this possibility and how it could have occurred. And I think it could have occurred again right in the middle of what we know as our modern history. You know, if you look at the history books, the fall of Rome occurred in AD 476. Then, then there was this roughly thousand year period of the Middle Ages or Dark Ages where no advancements occurred, nothing happened. People were just basically trying to survive and battling the plague and diseases and famine and pestilence. And then all of a sudden, the Renaissance occurred. And the things that we saw right at the end of the fall of Rome, we saw come back like it never happened. <laughs> what if it never truly did happen? And that the fall of Rome, as we know it, which really nothing fell in Rome. Rome continued. Uh, it was just a changing of the guard, if you will. But that the Renaissance was simply a continuation of this culture um, and was contemporaneous with um, what we know as, quote, the time period around the fall of Rome. And... You know, what happened also during that time period that could have fooled the masses was the changing of the calendar, truly. Um, Pope Gregory the Thirteenth in 1582, which I think was 580, 582, 582 years after the birth of Christ, changed the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar and literally added days to it. But what if he also not only added days, but added a thousand years to it? And let me show you how I think this happened.
And again, watch some of my other videos. It has other videos within my videos to show how people after Christ dated the year. And that after Christ are BC, AD time was established before Christ Anno Domini before Christ AD Anno Domini year of the Lord and that documents coins you know you name it maps we'll, we'll, I'm gonna show you some more evidence of this that it was written AD I then the date I for Aesis Jesus there was no J during this time period. The J, the font J in the alphanumerical system did not come into existence until the 1700s. So before that, J's were written with the character I, either capital or small letter. Um, you know, if you go back to the King James Bible and look at the Gospel of John, it's spelled I-O-H-N. Um, so, my hypothesis is that historians are looking at these coins, these documents, and because of the possibility of addition of a thousand years in the middle of our timeline, they are misconstruing what these dates are. And for instance, this coin, that it's not 1579, but it's I-579, it's Anno Domini, you're the Lord Jesus, Aesis 579. And you can see clearly it's a different font from the numbers. It's the same font as the letters. Let's go to another coin. You see this. This is Anno Year Jesus 650. This is not a one. This is an I. You see this. I-650. This is not 1650. This is I. Jesus. Aesis. 650. 650 years after the birth of Jesus Christ. You can see a pictorial of Jesus Christ on the cross with the character here I-659 that's not a one here's a one right there another coin again you'll see in all these documents they are written differently they're either in bold they're spaced differently it's a different font but this is you're the Lord Jesus I 650. We can go to Bibles. This is the Dewey Reams Bible. And if you blow this up and look at this, this is I 599. This is 599 years, the Dewey Reams Bible, after the birth of Christ. Not 1599 years but 599 years. It's, a, it's an I. That is not a, here's an I here. It's not a number. And it's in a different font. It's smaller to distinguish itself from the numbers. Here's a map that we can blow up and look at the date. I-597. Here's a one here. This is an I. It's written smaller. It's different. This is Year of the Lord Jesus 597 with a number one reference tab next to it. Here's another map. And I'll show you, this is sort of where confusion can happen. You know, you have this French map, I, six, and then another I. You can see ones here 
you have a one here and an I here. So what is it? You know, is this an I? Is this a one? Is this a one and a one? Is this an I and a one? Yeah, but if you look at the entirety of the map and look down in this area, you can see I613. So this is dated supposedly 1613, but this map shows I613. That's different from this. That's an I with a dot. That's not. That is different from this. So you can see where confusion comes in. It may be not on purpose. It may be on purpose that some of these documents have been, um, you know, written this way. Here's another map. Again, this map was in... 1632. Is this 1632 or I, you're the Lord Jesus, 632? You know, here's some more dates. Is this 1614, 15, and 18? Or is this I614, I615, and I618? for 614, 15, and 18 years respectively after the birth of Christ. You can see it's spaced differently. There's more space right here than the rest of the number. You know, you can go on this part of the map down here. Again, is this 1603, 1629, and 1632, or I-603, I-629, and I-632? Some more examples. This is the Book of the Common Prayer. And if we get on to the date, it was printed in Year of the Lord, is it 1549 or you're the Lord Jesus 549? Is this 1549 or you're the Lord Jesus 549? You can see again, it's an I, it's spaced differently, it's smaller, and it's in correlation, if you look at spacing, with you're the Lord. You're the Lord Aesus. Jesus, 549, is what I think it means. It's even in Shakespeare. You know, look at a lot of old title pages of Shakespeare. And you'll see, this is from Titus Andronicus, one of his older plays. You can see here, it was printed. Is this in 1594 or... I-594. This is definitely an I. Is this a Roman numeral one that's just spaced differently and smaller? Or is this Year of the Lord 594 that Shakespeare wrote the play Titus Andronicus? You look at old atlases. This is uh, the cover of um, the Mercator's historical atlas of the world and there's a lot of interesting pictures in here but just getting to the date here's the date is this map atlas made in 1637 or is it made in the year of the lord jesus 637 again it's spaced differently different size of the font Let me show you some maps. This is a map of Tartary and researching the land of Tartary and the Tartarian Empire is pretty interesting in and of itself.
But if we blow this up, I want to show you a couple of really interesting things. If you go up to the top of this map, this is where Siberia is today. You will see in Tinduk, there's a kingdom where Christians reigned in the year. Is that 1290 or is that year the Lord Jesus I-290? Did Paul's ministry in Asia come up to this area as we know as northern Russia today and a group of disciples established a city and reigned in that kingdom 290 years after Christ. I mean, just think about it. We're not even 290 years since the, since the United States gained their independence. That's plenty of time for people to go this far and establish a city. And, you know, if you keep looking, there's so many interesting things. I'll link a couple of these maps, too, for you. Here's the Great Wall of China, you know. And it says a wall of 400 leagues built between the bottoms of the mountains by the king of China against the incursions of the Tartars. So if you see here, China at this time period, and I think this was in the 1600s, I'll, I'll look at the date. <laughs> we need to look at the date to see what it shows. Basically, China now owns all this part that used to be Tartaria. And that was, the, the Great Wall of China was basically the northern border of China at that time. Now it's in the middle of China because they've gained all this territory. But that used to be Tartary. And let's go to, let's look at the date on it. A new map of Tartary, Anno, is this, is this 1626 or is this year the Lord Jesus 626? And were those Christians there 1290 years after the birth of Christ or 290 years after the birth of Christ? Christ. Again, let's look at some more stuff. This is, uh, I think this is Dewey Reams Bible. Anno 589. Is this 1589 or the year of the Lord Jesus with an I? 589. You can see that the I is written in the same font as Anno, year of the Lord Jesus, and it's a different font. Different size than that. You know, let's go to some more maps. Let's look at this map. You know, look at the date there. Anno I-688. That's not a one. That's an I. It's written in the same font as Anno, year of the Lord Jesus, 688. And what's interesting here, it shows California as an island. And it could have been. You know, let's look at some dates here. You all know if you can see this good, but there's the date I-534, I-539, I-542. You look right there in the middle. It says Spagnoli Lano, Spanish land, i 598. If you look just below the mountains underneath uh, North Granada, Morada. If you look at this some more, if you go around the bend and read under the Caribbean, Caribe, right there, you see I 493. You know, this is dating it the year after Columbus supposedly. Um, explored this land and these islands in the Caribbean, you know, is that's an I in front of the four right there. That's I-493. That's year of the Lord Jesus, 493. I'm 
We got some more. I mean, this, I mean, it, it never ends. You, you can spend literally hours and not find everything there is. There's so many documents and maps. This is an old book. The first part of the elementary, which entreateth chiefly of the right writing of our English tongue. Uh, basically, Richard McAllister. It's a book by Richard McAllister written in 16, or rather 1582. And you can see I-582. It's a different font. It's spaced differently. And then this is somebody's actual handwriting. This may be Thomas... Uh, I don't know that last name, but look at this. This is somebody's actual handwriting in the year, is it 1623 that he signified this date? Or year of the Lord Jesus, I-623. I, this, is, this is a different font. It's a different size, and it's bold. It's completely different. It's not signifying a thousand years. It's signifying year of the Lord Jesus. Here's another old letter. You know, if we go up to the top of this letter, here's a one right there, 131. If you go down to the date, November 18th, is this 1605 or is this I-605? You know, this is a one. It's written with sort of a scroll you know, a continuation like cursive within the next number is the same size as the next number. But you go here, the next number is twice as big. There's no cursive continuation. It's separate. It's the year of the Lord Jesus, 1605. Here's another book, old book, you know, this is printed in the year of the hangman's downfall. Is this 1649 or I 649? And this is the confession of Richard Brandon. Look at the date here. Again, this is written in cursive. It's separate in the sense that there's more spacing here. It's smaller than all the other. I think this is an I here that's you're the Lord Jesus 649. You know, I showed a lot of headstones. Look, you know, here's a headstone, um, you know, of somebody who passed away 1,655 years after the birth of Christ or 655 years after the birth of Christ. You see in the day of September, Anno Domini I-655. This I is not a one connected to these numbers right here. This I is connected to Lord. <laughs> Domini Jesus. That's how they wrote it. Anno Domini year of the Lord Jesus. So we could just go on and on with all this, but you know, let's get into a little bit of scripture. And then I want to play a little clip of this video that again, re, you know, sparked my interest in looking at this further. But, you know, the passage that we're looking at is the millennial of the millennial reign this thousand years of revelation 20 you know six times and we'll read it in revelation 20 i'll just read the first seven verses and i saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of bottomless pit, pit and a great chain in his hand and he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent which is the devil and satan and bound him a thousand years cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. 
On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And I'll stop there. But six times in seven verses, a thousand years is mentioned. You know, and because, like I mentioned in my other videos, this is hammered so many times over and over. A thousand years, thousand years, thousand years. In Revelation 20, I always thought this to be a literal thousand years. And so, you know, a literal thousand years is the viewpoint of a premillennial that is looking forward to the second return of Jesus Christ. And then afterwards, that thousand year reign is Jesus Christ established in his kingdom on earth. But the more I read scripture, Jesus isn't going to reestablish a fleshly kingdom on earth. You know, his kingdom spiritual. And so I began looking at the amillennial viewpoint, which looks at the millennium, this thousand years that's occurring right now. But it's not a literal thousand years. It's a spiritual. It's the church age and that we're reigning through the Holy Ghost, being indwelled in believers through the gospel right here, right now as priests and kings on earth for the glory of the Lord to teach, preach the gospel to all nations. You know, and how could it be literal if we're truly in 2019, right? A thousand years has already passed. But if it really hadn't, and a thousand years has been added to our timeline through the dark ages, which I think never existed, then we're not 2019 years since the birth of Christ, but only a thousand and nineteen years since the birth of Christ. And so, you know, like I mentioned in the other videos, this could be a new eschatology viewpoint where we are ruling and reigning as kings and priests right now in the church age, which could be a literal thousand years. And, you know, on the other videos, I looked at this as the clock starting this time period of a thousand years at the time at Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, when he overcame sin and death. And that started the millennial reign. And if we look at most historical evidence, that happened anywhere between AD 30 and AD 33. So we're getting close, you know, if the millennial reign started at that time, 8030, to a thousand years being 1030, as we know, 2030, but either way, 11 years from now. You know, it could be 8033s, which some people, which would push it to 14 years. And I'm not setting a date, not knowing the day and hour, but I think that we do need to be looking and watching, like Christ said, and looking for these signs and seasons and trying to see where we are in this chronology because it is a certainly that Christ will return and we do we want to be sober we want to be seeking and searching and finding out if we are that generation and if we are we need to be ready and so you know again I always thought of it as that you know that thousand years and you know that if this was true, then we could be at the end of end times in another decade or two uh, where the Great Tribulation could be occurring um, and followed by uh, the wrath of the Lord and his return. But I watched this video and it got me thinking about this a little more. We know that after the thousand years, as it says, in Revelation 27, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And this is known as a little season, a little while. It's referred to two or three times as this short time period. So I want to play this video and then we're going to talk about looking at this where this thousand years what if the clock didn't start at the death, burial, and resurrection, but started at the birth of Christ, when God manifests in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ? And that if that time period started, as we know it, 1 AD, because there's no zero, right? And 1 BC is before Christ, 
So if it started at 1 AD, then 1,000 years added to that would be 1,001. But if 1,000 years has been added to our calendar, then we know it as 2001, which is already passed. So what if this millennial reign has ended and that we are now in this little season, this short while, this time period where Satan is loose from his prison? We don't know exactly how long that lasts. We do know that there's a three and a half year time of great tribulation at the end of this little season, but we're not sure. We don't know in scripture if this three and a half years is the true little season, little while or not. What if it's longer and that it's taken and Satan is given more than three and a half years to deceive the nations and try to come against God through an earthly realm, if you will. And, you know, I don't want to get ahead of myself on this video. So watch five minutes of this video. I'll link it and you'll get an idea of what I am looking at with this thousand years. And if it's possibly at an end and that we're in the little season. And I think it's going to be very interesting to take a look at this. The theory is that this thousand years that Satan is bound is indeed the thousand hidden years on the calendar, the thousand hidden years of our being. Revelation talks about Satan being locked up for a thousand years, and the hypothesis says, and follow this, ladies and gentlemen, it's interesting. There was no year zero, and that's, that's a fact. So we can assume that the first year was year one. And if Satan was locked away for 1,000 years, is it possible that 1,000 years has been added to our timeline, ladies and gentlemen? Therefore, year one plus a thousand years would be 1001 would be the true date 1001 if you add another thousand to 1001 what do you get you get 2001 and ladies and gentlemen do you remember what happened in 2001 we remember that the twin towers in New York City were attacked Whomever you think did it, I think most of us that listen to this channel think that it is, ladies and gentlemen, thinks that it is a ritual. What if, ladies and gentlemen, it was a celebration? And what if it was a celebration of the release of Satan after 1,000 years of captivity. Now I'm not saying that I totally buy this, but think about it. Has the world changed since 2001? We could argue that the world has profoundly changed since 2001. We can argue that the world has never been the same since. 2001. Was it indeed a celebration of the release of Satan after 1,000 years of captivity? And a deeper question, have they, the ubiquitous they, those that are behind the curtain pulling the strings, Michelle Cannon Free, interestingly adding that there were demonic faces in the cloud plumes, whether that is pareidolia, is that the word for that? You see things that aren't there? or whether it really was, is another interesting conjecture. But have the MFers, the money funders, have those that control the fear and guilt control matrix, have they been planning for this release for the last couple hundred years or so? 
birth in the United States, world wars. Nigel says, guys, this makes so much sense to me. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Well, Nigel, here you go. I think it's fascinating. I think it's interesting. I think that there's probably a reason why that 1,000 years of Satan being bound is added into the scriptures. Madame Cat says, the superculture, as Jason Horsley calls it, the MFers, the money funders, it certainly has caused me to begin to sit up and take notice. It certainly is causing me to ponder because it does make a lot of sense. That thousand years isn't thrown in there for nothing. So I'll stop there, but you get the point. What if this thousand years known as the Dark Ages was a fabrication that's been added to our calendar and that the time period of this millennial reign began at the birth of Christ and that in 2001, which truly may be 1001, a thousand years after his birth, that the millennial reign has expired. Now, Christ is still ruling and reigning, but that this thousand year period has expired and Satan's little season has began. And what it was kicked off at 9-11. And again, like uh, Jeff Dougherty, I think Dougherty, I'll link the video and I appreciate him, you know, looking at this. But, you know, what if 9-11 was a celebration, like you said? What if it was a ritual? What it was a celebration of the loosing of Satan and the beginning of this little season? And... You know, how long is this little season, if this truly indeed is the case, how long could it last? You know, we can only speculate. Um, and we'll try to look through scripture down the road, I will, to see if we can get a hint as to um, this time period. But, you know, my initial thoughts are Satan is an imitator and as trying to set up, you know, and eventually will set up an antichrist figure you know the spirit of antichrist has been occurring in this entirety of these last days um those who want to be like christ oppose christ um you know satan leading the charge but you know what if his ministry what if, what if his quote lifespan of this little season was 33 years um like the life of jesus from his death till his um, or from his birth to his crucifixion and Jesus three and a half year ministry. What if Satan has a similar ministry of three and a half years and that we're, you know, forewarned about it in the Bible, especially in the book of revelation, uh, as being this time of great tribulation. So, you know, I just want to look at a few scriptures to make the point that this day of the Lord, this millennial reign, this Anno Domini, you're the Lord, Isis, Jesus, could, you know, the time, timeline could be not at his death, burial, and resurrection, but at the birth of Christ. You know, in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, Isaiah writes, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. And if you go to Luke 4, Jesus quotes Isaiah 61. And I'll read Isaiah 4, 16 through 19 or through 21 and he came to nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was he went into the synagogue speaking of jesus on the sabbath day and stood up for to read and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet isaiah and when he had opened the book he found the place where it was written the spirit of the lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book 
And he gave it again to the minister and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So Jesus is stating that the fulfillment of this day of the Lord is now, that his kingdom is now, before his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, and that it started possibly when God manifests in the flesh, when, you know, the prophecies of a Messiah to come were fulfilled through the birth, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And what if this was the kicking off of a literal thousand year reign that we see referenced six times in Revelation 20? You know, Paul writes of this in 2 Corinthians uh, 6, 1 and 2. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know, and this Satan being bound this thousand years, you know, now Satan still has, in my opinion, he has influence, obviously, through the spirit of Antichrist, through, you know, evil men and the wickedness of man itself, you know, um, through sin and, you know, the wicked deeds of the flesh that are in opposition to the perfect righteousness of God, but that he can't deceive the nations anymore, as it says. So he still has influence, <laughs> you know, but he's bound in being able to deceive the nations. And, you know, if you look at this thousand years, this millennial reign, what you see over and over is the ability of Satan being allowed to bring about great tribulation to the church and to persecute the church. The woman who flees from the face of the serpent in the wilderness and is, you know, carried away by two great wings of an eagle. You know, that's who Satan has been persecuting this thousand years. You know, he lets the unsaved, those who have rejected or have not heard the gospel as of that point in time and has been influenced by the worldly kingdom. You know, he just wants them to stay, um, you know, bound in this earthly kingdom and not find the grace of God and his mercy through the good news of Jesus Christ. But the gospel binds him. Um, and if we continue, we can see a lot of, um, scripture about this, you know, pointing to the last verse that we read in Luke, you know, well, let me go to it. Um, Luke chapter 10, verse 17, and the 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather joy, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And then we see this in Revelation 12, 9 and 10. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accused of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So I think this is the time, this is at the time of Christ. This is the fulfilling of prophecy uh, of the Messiah to come when Satan is cast out and, you know, his deceiving of the whole world stops during this millennial reign. Again, he's bound and allowed to persecute the church, um, you know, the tribulation of the saints uh, and the patience that that brings about. Um, but 
what I think ultimately deceiving the nation simply means is the hastening of a world judgment. You know, I think that Satan obviously was instrumental in the influencing of men before the first judgment by the flood of Noah. And that after that judgment, there was a time period where Noah and his family spread the gospel. Now, granted, Tower of Babel ha happened, you know, within a hundred, a little over a hundred years after that. But just checking Tom, sorry, this is running long. I'm about, I'm about finished. But after that, you know, this was the time period of Abraham. Then, um, you know, Isaac and Jacob and the children of Israel, uh, Moses, this time period um, where God used a nation to spread his good news of the Messiah to come to the world. And Satan was gaining more and more influence. And that God, through him manifesting in the flesh, fulfilling prophecy through Jesus Christ, stopped that hastening of this deception of the nations. And now we're in this thousand year reign where Satan can persecute the church, but not deceive the nations. And what I think this deceiving the nations ultimately simply means is to influence mankind to hasten the end of the world again. Um, you know, and, and I've talked about this on some other videos, but I think it ultimately happens through um, Satan influencing man to change mankind and God's image through man into something different, something more of his liking. Um, you know, and ultimately, I think this will come about uh, through artificial intelligence and transhumanism. I've made videos on that. Don't mean to get off subject on that, but I think that is something that we need to be watching and looking for. Um, and, you know, just getting back to this guy's video about what if this millennial reign ended in 2001, really 1001, thousand years after the birth of Christ, that we're now in Satan's little season. Just think of all the changes um, that have happened over the last 18 years, you know, uh, with technology and with um, the exponential growth of technology and the internet and artificial intelligence and transhumanism and the avatar project that they have, this, um, you know, computer brain interface that they're trying, the BCI that they're trying to do with Elon Musk, uh, with his company Neuralink, uh, which literally is looking to uh, download humans, thoughts, emotions, personality, basically their being onto a computer interface and transpose that either into something not of flesh and blood like a cyborg or some type of robotic body or hybrid or a new reality in and of itself into an avatar type um, reality. And that's coming. It sounds science fiction, but it's right around the corner. And that's why I think that we could literally be in this little season right now. You know, you see all the um, perversion and uh, of the image of man and woman, um, you know, just especially in the last 10 years with this transgender phenomenon that we see now. You know, I'm a plastic surgeon. I'm right in the middle of seeing this evolve right before my eyes. Five years ago, there was no such thing as a lecture on transgender assignment surgery. Now, they in plastic surgery, there are week-long courses where plastic surgeons can go to learn this. Um, and I've seen it, you know, um, just within my profession, but obviously the media pushes this transgender culture on our children and... Uh, especially college where you take courses to be sensitive to this. You know, this basically is a bridge to transhumanism. Transgender is just a bridge to the ultimate goal of 
humanity, the world being accepting of not only changing their sex, but changing flesh and blood completely into another entity. Um, you know, and I don't think God's going to allow that ultimately to happen, whether it's a uh, man trying to manipulate through, um, you know, technology and transhumanism and artificial intelligence, or if there's a component of genetic engineering, um, you know, and, um, uh, genetic manipulation, cloning, things of that nature. Ultimately, God's not going to allow that to happen. Um, so that's why I think we may be in the season right now and that we need to be watching. Um, you know, getting back to scripture, just to finish this up in, you know, John 16, seven, Jesus says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away for if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not in me, on me of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So, you know, I think this is speaking of this time period of uh, after his resurrection ascending to the right hand of the father, the Holy ghost, the comforter being indwelled in believers to rule and reign on earth through the spirit, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ during possibly a literal millennial reign. Um, you know, and, Mark 3, Jesus says in verse 24, And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. So through the fulfillment of prophecy in Jesus Christ, God has spoiled Satan's house and bound Satan from a spiritual standpoint where he has not been able to deceive the nations to get to this end point of judgment until the gospel has gone out to all nations through believers, through the indwelling of the spirit, proclaiming the gospel. But after this thousand years, then this little season comes about prior to the great tribulation and end. You know, and so... Again, just a couple more verses, Colossians 2, 13 through 15. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So since the birth of Christ, since his sinless life, his ministry proclaiming the good news, the kingdom of God, to mankind and through his death, burial, and resurrection, dying for our sins, overcoming death through us, through his resurrection. That's the gospel. That's what we believe in. That's what we trust in. That's what we, we rely on for the forgiveness of sins and life eternal. This thousand years, this church age, could it be spiritual? And is it coming to an end now? Are we starting to see this exponentially hasten to an end? We need to get the message out. We need to get the gospel out, but we also need to show people where we possibly are on our timeline and where we possibly are in our paradigm. And, you know, again, this is not a video to predict the day or the hour, but we can be looking toward a season. You know, is this new millennium that we began in 2001, is this, was that the end of the millennium, the literal thousand years? that was prophesied in Revelation 20, and now are we in the little season? You know, we don't, again, we don't know the day or hour, but in, Revel in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1, it says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, for when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, 
that that day should overcome you as a thief. Ye are children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. This is all speaking of spiritual, being awake spiritually, abiding in the Word of God, trusting in His promises, being aware of the times that we're in, and watching and being sober and looking out for the hastening of the day of the Lord. Continuing in verse 8, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So us alive today as believers are ruling and reigning right now in the church age with the saints who are in heaven with him in spirit. We're all waiting the redemption of the body. We're waiting for the return of the Lord after this day of the Lord ends. And it will end. And my question is, how soon is it going to end? Again, has that millennium, that thousand years that we see in Revelation 20, has it come to an end? If we're counting down from the birth of Christ and if a thousand years has been has been fabricated and added to our calendar to deceive us from how far away we are to the end, but also pushing us away from the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. You know, what if the millennials who we know that get a bad rap, what if they truly are the last generation? What if all these secular terms that we see, what if they have spiritual significance? So we need to be aware of this. We need to watch. And if you guys see more uh, scripture that can give additional insights into this topic, please leave them in the comments. Um, I'll add this and I'll wrap it up and we'll take another look at it um, soon. God bless.